After the Revolutionary War, America was still very much a wild and untamed land. The newly freed colonists were earnestly attempting to build an economy, a self-sufficient economy, but they faced one major drawback. Nothing moved faster than a horse. Transportation was crude, slow, and terribly expensive. The rugged hills and mountains of America presented seemingly insurmountable problems to moving products inland. And yet, there was water. And the one aspect of the Blackstone Valley that makes it stand out was the early vision of many of its residents. Some men saw water as a means of solving their transportation problems. Hi, I'm Chuck Arning, National Park Service Ranger, here in the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And the great canal building era of England was already well underway. Matter of fact, by 1772, one builder in particular, James Brindley, had laid out and constructed over 360 miles of canal, mainly from the coal mining areas of Wolseley to the industrial city of Manchester, England. And here in the Blackstone River Valley, adventurous Americans were also looking at the canal as a means of carrying great quantities of product off the docks in Providence inland. But laying out and constructing a canal, while it presents one set of problems, the actual day-to-day -day maintenance and operation of the canal sets up a whole new set of issues, some vastly more complex. So join me as we attempt to answer the question of what caused the death of the Blackstone Canal. Was it new technology in the form of the railroads? Or was it a classic human flaw that brought the canal company to its knees? Stay with us as we attempt to answer the question of what killed the Blackstone Canal. We're here in Providence, Rhode Island. Behind me is the home of John Brown, a notable merchant. Today it's a museum, but the most important thing to remember is that the merchants of Providence during this period were very eager to find new markets for the merchandise. And the first attempt to build a canal between Providence and Worcester would fall into the category of missed opportunities and would in fact give historians and National Park Service rangers pause for a moment to consider what if. Now to find out why the first attempt was a failure, we're going to join Massachusetts Forest and Parks interpreter Val Stegmoen, who's at the Blackstone Canal at Riverbend Farm in Uxbridge, Massachusetts. In researching the Blackstone Canal, an area of time that I have found most interesting is that of the late 1700s. As a nation, we had just gained our independence from England. We had fought hard. Uh, but economically, were we really independent? I think of the actions and the suggestions and the advice that George Washington and his advisors were making at that point in time. Washington, in the first year of his presidency, in the fall of 1789, made a trip or a tour through the New England state. From New York to Boston, he traveled the Upper Post Road through Worcester, right through the Blackstone Valley, spending a night here in Uxbridge at the Samuel Taft Tavern. Although his experience was noted as pleasurable at that overnight stay, his diaries do indicate that the roadways in the area were in pretty poor condition. During that trip, he made often notes to the uh, prosperity of the various uh, communities that he traveled through. So it is not surprising that in that point in time, 1789 and uh, 1790, that Washington and, advisor and his advisors were making recommendations that as a nation, we should be building manufactories and improving our transportation. John Brown and a number of the prominent merchants in the Providence area heeded the words and advice of George Washington and laid plans for a canal, a grand canal, along the Blackstone 
from the tidal water of Providence up through the Providence plantations and through central uh, Massachusetts and the Worcester County on into New Hampshire into the Connecticut River. Very grand proposal at a point in time when there was no canals constructed in this country. John Brown was successful in gaining legislation in Rhode Island in 1796 to lay out a canal along the Blackstone River through Rhode Island from Providence to the state line. A corresponding legislation in Massachusetts was met with a counter proposal to build a canal from Boston to Worcester. According to the early newspaper accounts, the Massachusetts spy reported that the legislators and merchants felt that Boston would revert to a fishing port if they lost the commerce of central Massachusetts and the Worcester area to, of all places, Providence, Rhode Island. It was these fears and thoughts that were probably instrumental in the Blackstone Canal's first planned effort not to be constructed. It was 25 years that those pl plans laid dormant until the Blackstone Canal could actually become a reality. The sequence of events that killed the first proposal to build the Blackstone Canal would return and plague the canal project throughout its existence. We've learned through research that the special interest groups never really saw the big picture. They didn't understand what the benefits of the canal project could bring to the region. And this would emerge as a critical flaw in the canal project. The Boston-based Massachusetts legislature's inability to see that what was good for the central part of the state, the Worcester area, could also be a boon to Boston, would be a reoccurring theme. The only difference? Swap one special interest group for another. None would have the necessary vision. John Brown's dream of connecting distant New England markets by canal, despite its technical issues, would never achieve the grandeur in future generations. Significant historical events are based upon timing, the right person, and a critical decision all coming together. It didn't happen for the first attempt at the Blackstone Canal. Would the region be lucky enough and get a second chance? Well, the answer is that John Brown's nephew would start the process all over again in the 1820s. And once again, Providence would gear itself up for the expansion of the possible canal. Now, to understand how that canal would work here in Providence, we're going to catch up with my ranger friend and colleague, Kevin Kleiberg. Hi, I'm National Park Service Ranger Kevin Kleiberg, and today I'm in the middle of Providence, standing right at the falls of the Meshastic River. And this little piece of water right here has played quite a role in the development of the city. In 1646, John Smith put his grist mill and tannery right about this spot to be powered by these falls, and that was the first water-powered mill in the city of Providence. About 180 years later, this stretch of water served as the Blackstone Canal as it continued on its route down from Worcester, Massachusetts to the port of Providence, Rhode Island. Starting from about Scott's Pond up in the Lonsdale and Salesville sections of Lincoln, the canal would follow the course of the Meshastic River for about four and a half miles until it reached the city of Providence. In most cases, it actually flowed through the river itself, but on occasion, they would channelize it through canal trenches in order to go around rapids or rocks or even try to eliminate some of the major bends in the river. As you can see around me, the uh, Meshastic River has changed greatly in the past 150 years or so. So you can see it's now been channelized on its way through the city and all remnants of the canal are gone. Well, just about all remnants of the canal are gone. If you know where to look, you can still find a few signs of them here and there. Just to the south of me, the Meshastic River continues on down and meets up with the Wanaskatucket River at Water Place Park and forms the Providence River. And the Providence River is, of course, the tidal body of water. So just a little bit before it reached the Wanaskatucket River, there was a tidal lock or a wooden dam built across the base of the canal in order to prevent all the canal water from escaping out with each tide. And that created a, t a basin, the canal basin, where the canal barges that came down would tie up and unload their goods into the city of Providence. These goods would then either be taken to uh, stores or warehouses throughout the city or taken directly to the other docks throughout the city along the Providence River or all the way down to India Point where they'd be loaded onto ships to be sent out around the country or around the world. And quite an industry was developed in this short transport business. 
uh, with stevedores and uh, transportation lines and small livery services. And a number of the people employed in those services were the free blacks of Providence, as it was one of the few jobs they could get back in that era. So although it's been drastically changed today, the Mashastic River still shows some of the signs of the important link that it served between Providence and the city of Worcester and the role that it played as part of the transportation system that brought the goods of the Industrial Revolution down here to their port city of Providence. Just how difficult is it to dig a canal? I mean, isn't it one big long ditch? Well, I'm standing right in the prism of the Blackstone Canal here at the Blackstone River and Canal Heritage State Park in Uxbridge, Massachusetts. And the prism is actually the bed of the canal. Here at the bottom, it's about 18 feet wide. And at the top, it gets up to 34 feet in length, giving you this prism concept here. And you can see this dry canal bed throughout the Blackstone Heritage State Park. It's quite visible in a number of different locations. Most people are surprised to learn that the actual depth of the canal was no more than four to six feet throughout its length from Providence to Worcester. And the towpath could be up to 10 feet in length. But depending on the terrain, it could be a lot narrower as well. Now getting back to my original question is just how hard was it to dig this canal? Unfortunately for the Blackstone Canal Company, it was a lot harder than it looked. You see, while many will view the Blackstone Canal as a relatively primitive construction, it was far from simple. For example, the canal channel had to be cut to exact specification, and the canal bed, the bottom of the prism, could not decline more than two inches per mile. If a worker went too deep with a shovel, it would require backfilling, leaving the canal bottom weak and porous. The cut of the prism had to be carefully laid to terrain and allow water courses that would feed the canal appropriate entries. Suddenly, this simple ditch appears to be a little bit more complex to dig. Enter the enthusiastic merchants and canal investors of Providence, figuring that this was not a complex operation and not waiting for Benjamin Wright, the chief engineer, to return from his task of completing the Erie Canal, the Rhode Island Canal Company hired a labor force of seamen, stevedores, farmers, and layabouts from the poorest sections of Providence. The Irish canal builders of the Erie Canal had built specific equipment to handle the specific nature of their work. There's no evidence that the first wave of laborers working on the Blackstone Canal had any such tools or even knowledge of their existence of these tools. Yet, construction began and with early positive results. It wasn't until the builders ran into the first inclines and intersecting waterways that work slowed. And as problems mounted, trying to cross low-level bogs and streams and the inability to maintain a dry prism, labor problems also developed. By mid-August, work was at a standstill. And then, heavy autumn rains washed out most of the first year's work. Then, in late December, a dam broke in Central Falls, washing out whatever was left of the prism. So we have a situation here where almost a whole year of payroll was used up without any usable canal trench to show for it. This would be the first major financial setback that the canal would experience. However, it wouldn't be the only one. The most critical problem in the construction of the canal was with the actual survey. The chief engineer, Benjamin Wright, an accomplished one, would turn over most of the responsibility for surveying the canal to one of his young assistants, Holmes Hutchinson, who was in fact learning his craft. Now, I'm sitting on the side of Goat Hill, near Lock 25, here in the Blackstone River and Canal Heritage State Park. And I want you to look around me at the terrain I'm sitting in here, because this is going to be contrasted very sharply with the overly optimistic results of the survey that Holmes Hutchinson did. It was completed in September of 1822, and Holmes wrote, Mr. Hutchinson, accompanied by some of the gentlemen of the committee, completed a level over the route of the proposed canal. And they found the distance by measure 45 miles, as the canal would run, and the descent of 451 and a half feet from Thomas Street in Worcester to Tidewater in Providence. The ground is remarkably favorable, the soil generally easy to excavate, the embankments neither large nor extensive, very little solid rock to be removed, the aqueduct and culvert are not numerous or expensive. The rock I'm surrounded by is fairly common throughout the Blackstone River Valley, both in Rhode Island and in Massachusetts. Matter of fact, in the Quinville section of the canal in Lincoln, Rhode Island, there's evidence where some black powder was used to blast through some of the rock that was along the canal trench. It's also important to know that the Irish canal builders were paid an extra penny for every cubic yard of stone they removed from the trench. Now, despite an overly optimistic survey, the canal was surprisingly well built. To find out just how well built and how good a craftsmanship was used to build a canal 
We're going to catch up with my Ranger colleague, Dick Kleber, and take a look at some of the interesting aspects of constructing the Blackstone Canal. Now, Dick, we're at one of those aspects of the Blackstone Canal that not many, very many people see, do they? They don't. This is way back in the woods, and people are just not aware of it. This is, matter of fact, this is where the highway used to cross the river and the canal, not back over there where 122 is. And of course, all these stones, these are the abutments to the bridge. Now, where would they get stones like this? Well, there's a lock about 200 yards down here, and they had to cut stones for the lock. They had cut stones and rubble left over. And of course, they built this beautiful bridge abutment. But this had a purpose. Of course, the bridge abutment really makes it neat because you can start to understand how they towed the barges and what they did with the ropes. You know, every time you came to a bridge, you thought they had to undo the ropes and cross over, let the barge come through and hook them up again. But here was a good example, almost like a clover leaf. Now you can imagine a horse is walking along the towpath on that side, coming over the bridge, the barge is down in the water, the rope is here, then the horses would come down this side of the abutment and go under the bridge. Taking that rope with them, they wouldn't have to want to disconnect. And of course, vice versa, coming up the other side. Now remember, the towpath is now on this side. As you're towing the barge up, horses come up, up over the abutment, cross over the bridge, and go in that direction. The rope is still under the bridge. So it really made a practical way of transporting the barges. The highway went right across the river here over to the floodplain in the river. Big bend in the river over here. You may have noticed the uh, rubble. They, again, this is not only local boulders that they picked up, but it's also some of the rubble they used when they cut the stones for the lock. They piled them along the river to prevent the water from washing in against the towpath. It's amazing how much planning and work they did to make this canal as good as it was. Imagine trying to pull some of these stones weighing six tons over the dirt roads in those days. It would have been a real chore. So the idea was to get the stone as near to the place where they were building as possible. And of course, this hillside here, up on top, there's an edge where they got plenty of raw granite to work with. And so they cut the stone, bring it down to the canal, which was dry then. And then, of course, they could pull it along on stone snet sledges with the oxen and pull it up to where the lock was being built. And the same with the bridge here. We're standing in front of an early 1700s lime kiln. And we're in the village of Lime Rock in Lincoln, Rhode Island. And it has always been a struggle to get lime to market. But let's face it, cooked limestone is really heavy. But the opening of the Blackstone Canal was greeted with a great deal of enthusiasm, not only by the merchants of Providence, but also by the many small towns and villages throughout the Blackstone Valley. For the canal was going to solve some of the great transportation issues that vexed the good citizens of the valley. And Lime Rock is a case in point. December 5, 1828, aboard the canal boat Massachusetts, heading upstream to Worcester to a G. Payne, matter of fact, was 113 casts of lime from this village. That shipment weighed 23 tons. And the same day, coming down the canal, was a shipment of Worcester coal destined for Providence. Now, commerce was in the air and opportunities were abound. And to learn a little bit more about the entrepreneurs who took advantage of the canal, let's catch up with our good friend and ranger colleague, Jack Whitaker. This is Ranger Jack Whitaker, and I'm standing in the cellar hole of what was a storage building for Plumber's Landing. In 1837, a newly married couple, Amelia and Israel Plummer, opened a store here alongside Lock 26 of the Blackstone Canal. This was a busy intersection of a road that went from Northbridge over to uh, Upton and Menden. The canal came through here. There was a boat basin just to my right in this direction, and it was an obvious spot for a storehouse and shop to service the canal barges and to onload and offload goods from Providence to the south and the local farm areas here. We tend to identify canals by the cities they link, Providence to the south and Worcester to the north on the Blackstone, but you must remember there were villages and towns between the two and they too were serviced by the canal. And each one had at least one landing where 
uh, barges could pull in, offload, onload, and continue on their way north or south. To our north in uh, Grafton, there's another landing called Leland's Landing, similar to this. Now, the uh, plumbers did service the barges for a period of about 10 years. They opened the shop in 1837, nine years after the canal had opened. And the last barge to travel the full length of the canal uh, stopped here in 1844. The shop stayed open, the storehouse was still used because remember, these small villages along the canal depended on the barge traffic for their goods and to send their products out to Providence and the rest of the world. Uh, when the canal finally shut down in 1848 and the Providence and Worcester Railroad uh, opened up as the main transportation link between Worcester and Providence, the enterprising plumbers just turned their backs on the canal and moved about a half mile to the west and opened a store along the railroad track. The end of the canal as a transportation link did not mean the end of the canal for industrial use. The canal was used for power along the mills for many years thereafter. People like the plumbers who had made their living along the canal adapted to other forms of, of transportation, the railroad in particular. And the plumbers were very lucky to be in a spot where the canal and the railroad were close together. People in the valley both north and south were sensing opportunity. The Massachusetts yeoman, citing the need to establish better business ties with Providence, began acting as an agent both promoting and collecting subscriptions for the Rhode Island American, a Providence-based newspaper. Strong relationships, economic relationships, were being forged throughout the valley. So with all this activity, how can we consider the Blackstone Canal a failure? Well, to find the answer to that question, we're going to travel down to the mills of Rhode Island and hook up with Rick Greenwood, who's a historian for the Rhode Island Preservation and Heritage Commission. But the answer lies there. The legal definition of water power and water rights has to do with the water that flows down through the river at a regular rate, what is known as the natural run of the river. By law, you are not allowed to divert the natural run of the river so it deprives a downstream owner from the use of that water. You can use it, but you must return it to the canal, or to the river, which is essentially what the, the manufacturers did with their power canals. The alternative to natural run is reserved water water that would be collected during times of flood, which most normally occur in the fall and the winter. The problem came because the canal engineers, who were really looking at transportation cross country and not water power, chose to connect the Meshassuk River and the Blackstone River. And by doing that, the flow of the Blackstone River downstream got diverted into the Meshassuk River every time a canal boat locked through from one river valley into another. And as you know, the locks were quite sizable. That was a lot of cubic feet of water, about 5,000. Uh, that was water that was not going to pass over the dams in Valley Falls and Pawtucket and would not be available to turn the mill owners' water wheels. Naturally, they were very upset. Uh, most concerned, particularly in the summertime, when, as we all know, the rains uh, are scant and the, the evaporation is great and the river naturally runs low. If you're taking water out of an already low river, you may be spelling the difference between the ability to run your factory or to have it sit there dormant. The mill owners uh, were convinced by the canal owners' argument that they would build reservoirs upstream, that they would raise the dams on existing uh, ponds that now fed the river so that they would hold water in storage from the winter's floods that could then be released in the summer that would keep up the level of the river and basically compensate for all that water that might get diverted out uh, by the canal. And they agreed that the idea would work. And in fact, it did work, but not as smoothly as the canal owners would have liked. Uh, the problem really came unhinged in 1833, a year after the canal had its most successful year to date and had posted $18,000 in tolls, big increase from the previous years. Unfortunately, 1833 was one of those droughts that comes every so often and the river was running exceedingly low. The mill owners noticed a sharp drop off in their water power supply. They complained to the courts, and the courts found that indeed the canal company had not maintained their reservoirs in the manner that they said they would. The levels were much lower than what they had promised, and in effect supported the mill owners' claims 
and I believe there were over 200 claims lodged against the canal, all of which they were found guilty of. The canal faced not only a drop in tolls that year, but serious legal costs as well. Now, conventional wisdom says it was really the railroad that put, uh, was a death knell of the canal. In your opinion, how true is that? There's more than a grain of truth in that, Chuck. The, the canal had many problems. Uh, the railroad probably, I would say, would be the single greatest. Everybody knows that Boston was a center of railroading. Well, one of the reasons they were a center of railroading is that they were deeply concerned about the inroads that Providence merchants were making into Worcester County. Uh, the canal had proved a tremendous success in carrying goods into Worcester County and bringing the produce of Worcester County out. But instead of the traditional port of Boston, it was all going to Providence. Boston, which was a commercial city, was seriously concerned about this. And in 1831, they made the rather bold move of deciding to build a railroad all the way to Worcester. It was completed in 1835, and in fact, the first locomotive that ran uh, in New England ran between Boston and Worcester. 1835, it was completed, and in the following year, 1836, the dividends on the canal dropped 20%. The railroad was a tough act to compete against. It could run all year long. It wasn't subject to low water. It wasn't subject to freezes in the winter. And uh, if you're competing against somebody, as we all know, what you try and do is keep your rates low so you offer a good bargain, uh, which they did. They could also move much more quickly than the canal. And you have to say that the railroad was indeed a serious problem for the canal. Not the only problem. Uh, the canal could well have continued to operate for, for a much longer period than it did had it been able to provide a, a good enough service, at least on the lower stretches of the canal, maybe not all the way to Worcester, but there's an awful lot of, of industry and commerce in the areas that weren't being served by that Boston and Worcester Railroad that the canal could have captured, uh, which, but they were never really effective in really convincing people that they were the best way to travel and their dividends continued, their, their dividends disappeared and their tolls continued to drop. The beneficiaries of the canal were multitude. Uh, the canal was a, a real spark. It, it happened at a time when uh, both the economy and the society were sort of on the verge of a tremendous change, part of this industrial and transportation revolution that really transformed the valley at this time. And the canal was, was sort of the spark for a lot of that. It put places on the map, places like Millbury, where there might be one or two factories. Uh, at the time that the canal left, they had their own branch railroad. They were building factories on sites that had been improved by the canal. Population was swelling, business was booming. The farmers had new markets for their produce. Uh, so particularly, I would say, in the Upper Valley, the uh, impact of this sort of economic infusion of life and money had a tremendous effect and really got these places uh, cooking. Uh, Worcester, I think most historians would, would agree, was on the verge of that kind of change anyway. But the canal coming as it did really made it a focus for development in Worcester County. Well, this has been Chuck Arning, National Park Service Ranger here in the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And despite the many problems, the most important to consider about the canal and its development was that it represented the first attempt at regional thinking. Rather than focusing on the needs of a single community or an entity, it looked at developing and linking together a series of communities for economic gain. It was really quite revolutionary for that time period. And when you think about the rapid social and economic growth the Blackstone Valley went through, it kind of stands testimony to the fact that our early forebears who lived here were quite visionary in their thinking. Even today, we might well reflect upon the benefits of a regional view of the world. Well, until next time, I hope to see you in the valley.